Greg Sheridan, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Big news, obviously, with Kim Jong-il's death. It wasn't entirely unexpected, I suppose, but how much is this going to change things in North Korea? Well, David, uh, really, he was the most uh, perverse and weird dictator uh, that the human race has thrown up in many centuries. Um, North Korea is best seen as a kind of uh, quasi-religious state with a, with a religious cult around the Kim family. Now, in the past, periods of instability have often seen it lash out uh, uh, with military provocations at South Korea. So I think we've already seen the South Korean uh, military go on high alert. Uh, it's very unclear whether the um, power transfer will occur as intended to his uh, psychopathic son, Kim Jong-un, uh, I would think it's more likely that a group of generals will take effective power in the meantime. Now, generally, that would encourage you because the military is a bit more rational than the Kim family. But on the other hand, most of these generals are relatives of the Kim family and their traditional way of showing how indispensable they are and also to show everyone that they're, they're still a mean, a mean dog on the patch is, is to lash out with military provocations. So... Uh, on the upside, I guess there's an outside chance that the outside world can entice them with some kind of uh, grand bargain uh, at this moment, but it's a very deeply uncertain period. Let me just pick up on something you said there about Kim Jong-un, the third son of Kim Jong-il, who he clearly was uh, propping up to take over the leadership. You, you call him psychopathic. We don't know a huge amount about this uh, young man. He's not yet 30, but uh, what makes you use that word? And I know you've spoken to a lot of, def or some defectors from, uh, from North Korea. What, what do you know about this guy? Well, uh, the, the, all three generations of the Kim family were very sadistic and bizarre human beings. Um, Kim Il-sung, the, the father, um, who set up the most Stalinist system in the world. Kim Jong-il, whose uh, who's penchant for kidnapping Japanese movie stars uh, uh, for bizarre personal behaviour, was only matched by the fact that he starved to death something like a, a third of his population. Now, the young guy, I've spoken to a lot of American um, uh, intelligence people who've worked very hard on the young guy. He was, uh, he was educated partly in Europe, they spoke to all of his classmates. He also has a very savage temper and uh, uh, behaves like a potentate's son, uh, meets out um, uh, horrible punishments to people who, uh, who cross him. And the military provocations that North Korea engaged in a couple of years ago were seen very much by American intelligence anyway as, uh, as Kim Jong-un showing to daddy that he was made of the right stuff. Uh, so that's uh, things like the sinking of the South Korean naval vessel, uh, the Chonam with 46 South Korean sailors killed, uh, the uh, um, unprovoked shelling of South Korean villages that the North Korean military engaged in a while ago. This was seen very much as Kim Jong-un in alliance with the military, showing that he was made of the right stuff to, uh, to continue the, uh, the family traditions. So how likely do you see it that he will uh, assume the leadership? And you talk there about other military generals uh, perhaps being in charge, at least for a while. Will there be friction between these senior generals and the, uh, uh, the heir apparent? There's a very strong possibility of that, although that's what Kim Jong-il has been working hard to avoid. Uh, it's a very opaque system, David, but let me give you my best guess. My best guess is that the military needs the continuing connection with the Kim family for its legitimacy, and therefore Kim Jong-un will have some kind of, uh, of legitimising role simply because he's, uh, he's daddy's uh, son, but that the effective power, of, at least for the moment, will uh, fall in the hands of, uh, of a group of generals. But these generals themselves are fully implicated in the Kim Jong-il regime, and many of them in fact, are relatives of the late Kim Jong-il, brothers-in-law and uh, cousins and nephews and so forth. Uh, the only way I'd see the system cracking open would be if the Chinese applied pressure. I think they're unlikely to do that because I think the status quo suits China uh, very well. But the, the risk of internal instability is very strong and it's a bit unclear whether the neighbours want instability or stability. Uh, South Korea, Japan, the United States would like a more reasonable North Korea, 
but they're also scared that the whole place may just uh, uh, collapse and explode. And we always have to remember that it probably has about 10 nuclear weapons and mm. um, is extremely paranoid and has a very shaky grasp uh, on reality. I want to ask you about that in just a moment, the security threat and the nuclear threat. But what about China? I mean, uh, you say that the status quo probably suits Beijing, but uh, it's, it's hardly a stable situation and extraordinary uh, famine uh, there in North Korea uh, and, and this uncertainty about the leadership and about its nuclear capability. Is this really a comfortable situation for China? Well, you're right, David, that China doesn't generally, generally like instability, but it, it has actually been relatively stable. It's been a stable state since it was established, and there are many elements of the status quo that serve China's purposes very well. If Korea were to be reunited, it would be reunited under the leadership of South Korea, which is a democracy, prosperous, and an ally of the United States. Now, China doesn't want a nation like that sharing a land border with it. Uh, sharing a land border with a country which is even more repressive and certainly a lot worse off than China is, that actually makes China look quite good. It's been a bit concerned by the inflow of North Korean refugees, but it's very brutally uh, forced them back into North Korea and, you know, uh, suppressed them at the border and so on. At the same time, it allows China to uh, really rattle both the United States and Japan, without having to, to own the action itself. You know, it can encourage North Korea or allow North Korea to cause trouble for Japan and the United States, but it doesn't have to pay the price for it. And it, finally, it gives China an extra leverage with the United States. The United States is always asking China for help with North Korea. Now, if the North Korea solu situation were solved, that would be one of the main things that Washington has to ask Beijing for help for off the agenda. So mm. I think all of these factors suit the Chinese and the Chinese are perfectly sanguine about uh, a famine which kills a third of the North Korean population. Uh, I mean, I don't think that rings their withers uh, one little bit. Yeah, bizarre the world of international diplomacy, if that's an asset for them. Uh, you mentioned the security uh, situation. Now, as you indicated earlier, um, provocative military actions have traditionally been a way of asserting authority within North Korea. How worried should its neighbours, South Korea and Japan, be about uh, some sort of incident in the coming weeks and months? I think that's a very strong possibility. I I've spent a lot of time in South Korea, a lot of time on the border, and uh, it's a bit like Israel and Palestine. What, what impresses you is how short the distances are within 20 or 30 kilometres north of the, of the uh, Korean border, uh, North Korea has thousands of artillery pieces nestled into the hillsides and virtually invulnerable to Allied air attack. Uh, and they could destroy the city of Seoul with its uh, 12 million inhabitants uh, in, in a day of shelling. Now, I don't think they're going to do that because that would mean their own regime would be incinerated. But they have a long history of uh, assassinating South Korean ministers, trying to assassinate South Korean presidents, uh, attacking South Korean ships and, uh, and shelling villages. Now, it's very hard to take effective military action against them because you don't know what their, uh, what their triggers for escalation are and when they, when they may go nuclear. Now, this regime in Pyongyang, although it's, it's very paranoid, it has been very interested in regime survival. So I think that will prevent them from going into a full scale military conflict. But I think, you know, we've already seen the South Korean military go on alert. And I think that is a sign that uh, some kind of declaratory action, just to show that the regime is still intact and still has a, a fierce character. See, the North Koreans put an enormous store by their martial character, their, their fighting spirit. The only institution in the country which gets any money is the army, and the only people who are well fed are the soldiers, and uh, they always want to demonstrate their, uh, their martial spirit. So I think the chances of some kind of military provocation are, are quite substantial in, over, the, over the next uh, you know, few weeks. And just finally, uh, Greg Sheridan, is there any chance uh, that the death of Kim Jong il uh, the removal of that uh, uh, reign of fear within North Korea could see any sort of 
democratic uprising or some sort of uprising that is going to end uh, this, this, uh, this dictatorship that has lasted for, for so long there? I think an uprising is unlikely. I've interviewed a lot of defectors and indeed a number of veterans of the labour camps in North Korea, and really there is nothing like them on earth. There is just nothing like them on earth, anywhere in the Middle East, anywhere in Asia. The degree of force and the degree of repression and the savagery of this regime in, uh, in killing people, in exiling people, in putting them in re-education camps for decades for the slightest hint of dissident opinion has left a very malnourished and um, demoralised population, which has also been brainwashed uh, about all their enemies overseas. I think if you do see any liberalisation in the North, it's more likely to be a brokered liberalisation uh, with some more rational elements of the leadership deciding that perhaps they could take a deal from the West. The reason they haven't taken a deal up till now is that they assess, probably quite rightly, that any opening up to the, to the outside world would show their own people what a miserable life they have in comparison with anyone else and they would quickly um, move to replace the regime. But you might get a military regime which is a little more rational and uh, is prepared to make some kind of deal at the margins. I'm sure they're never going to give up their nuclear weapons because that is their ultimate, uh, their ultimate guarantee. And the move... The mover for all this really has to be China. China has much more leverage on North Korea than the United States. And the fact that North Korea has been able to hold out for all these decades without making a deal, I think, is a sign of China's backing. So that the Chinese would have to think a deal was, was a good idea and the new North Korean leadership would have to think it's a good idea. It's possible, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet the house on it. Yeah, Greg Sheridan, foreign editor of The Australian, really appreciate your analysis of uh, this big news this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, David.